What's your story? What's your story? It's a very powerful and interesting question, isn't it? How we think about ourselves is shaped by how we tell our story. Of course, our memories are not perfect, and often how we remember things is not actually how they happen. Just put me and my two sisters together in a room, and you'll soon find that out. But how you tell your story has a massive impact on how you understand yourself. The brilliant father that you loved very much, or the father you never knew. The jobs you got, or the jobs you never got the opportunities you had or the opportunities you didn't have, the times you succeeded, the times you failed, the different ways we tell our story shapes who we think we are. It's a very, very helpful way, by the way, of getting to know people. If you and I want to be really good friends to people, then one of the easiest ways to be a really good friend is listen to other people's stories. When I first got here, you'll remember, I stood at the back of church for the first six months after every Sunday service with my diary. And I had 14 hours blocked out every week just to sit with people and I just stood there and said let me know when's good for you and I'll knock on your door I'd love to hear your story and it was a really lovely way of getting to know uh, anybody in the congregations who wanted to get to know me and I really enjoyed that listening to your stories it's a great way of being a really good friend the way we tell our stories shapes us and that's a little bit like what's going on here in Stephen's speech he's speaking to Jews And he's saying to Jews, let me remind you of our story. Think away from your story for a second and think about our national story. If you're uh, English here or British, what's our national story? It might include 1066 and Magna Carta. Something to do with Henry VIII and Elizabeth I and Drake and Spanish Armadas. It might um, link to uh, Commonwealth. It may reference Churchill and the world wars and so on and so on there are seminal people and key events that shape how we understand ourselves and different nations will have those differently I read a very stimulating book uh, last year uh, called the histories of the nations which was written by members of the um, the 50 most populous nations in the world explaining how they tell their national story So someone who is an Indian from India telling the story of India. Someone who's an Argentinian from Argentina telling the story of Argentina. Someone who's an Israeli who lives in Israel. It's very powerful. You you may have traveled enough to know that, that the way our newspapers present people isn't always quite right. Best to hear their story in their own words, in their own cultural context. What does a Swede who lives in Sweden say is their national story? And these were very short essays, just four or five pages. Very, very stimulating. And here is Stephen under attack. He's uh, on trial. And he's on trial in part with Jewish authorities. And the way that he goes about engaging with the charges is to say, let me tell you our story. We'll see that as we go through. And of course, if we're Christians here this morning, then the story of God's people, the Jews, is part of our story too. This will shape how we think of ourselves if we are believers here this morning. And if we're still thinking these things through, fantastic that you're here. We love having guests every week. We delight in that. This could be your story. It's a great story. Let's see what's going on. Verse 8, Stephen's a man full of God's grace and power. We've already heard in the last passage last week, full of the Spirit and wisdom. And he's performing wonders and signs, just as the early church was doing all the way through this uh, beginning of Acts. But verse 9, chapter 6, opposition arises. And what we've seen, as we've worked through the book of Acts so far, is that oppositions got worse. Chapter 4, we saw that the Christians were given warnings. In chapter 5, they were given floggings. And at the end of Stephen's speech next week, we'll see that there's an execution. So the more and more godly and the more and more vibrant and the more and more lively the church got, the greater the persecution. I pray every day for revival. I hope you do too. I hope we know what that would mean as well. Just got to be honest, haven't we? 
we long to see a revival in the church it won't be painless it will be brilliant and God will be very very good the opposition has grown and do you notice what happens verse 10 they can't stand up against Stephen's wisdom and the spirit given answers so verse 11 they persuade people to tell lies it's a bit like they did with Jesus isn't it it's no great surprise like they couldn't answer anything Jesus said he taught us one with authority so what do they do well they get trumped up charges together they can't argue with him so they persuade people to tell lies and it's really important that we understand the charge here because you, you won't understand Stephen's defense unless you understand what he's defending himself against. Look at it there in verse 11. These liars say, we've heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. The words against Moses are explained in verse 13 and 14. Look at it again there. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place, that's the temple, and change the customs of Moses, that's the law. So that the charges are twofold. He's speaking against Moses, that is the law and their customs. And he's speaking against the temple, this holy place, that is God himself. Can you see now why Stephen's going to step back and say, let's understand our story. Let's understand the God who's been faithful. Let's understand why he's given us a temple. That's going to be key to engaging with these um, these charges we'll see more of that next time when Stephen gets to his uh, conclusion and everybody there verse 15 they're sitting in the Sanhedrin they look at Stephen and they see that his face was like the face of an angel maybe his face was shining a bit like Moses face was shining when he came down off the mountainside they're gonna kill him but they've got every sign that this is God's chosen person and the high priest says, are these charges true? Now, if you remember last time, a couple of weeks ago, when we were um, in the book of Acts, we looked at the beginning of chapter 6, and we saw the issues around waiting at tables. And we saw that those things were very, very important, but that the apostles weren't going to be distracted from prayer and the ministry of God's word. We're all on the same team. We just play different roles in the team, and the center forward is not the goalkeeper. We play different roles on the same team. And Stephen is one of those who's been appointed by the elders to look after the issue around tables. Really striking, isn't it? The apostles had delegated waiting at tables to him. But you notice that Stephen hasn't delegated evangelism to them. It's really striking, isn't it? The apostles have delegated waiting at tables to Stephen. But Stephen doesn't stand up and say, hang on a minute, I just do tables here. Why don't you go and get one of the apostles and they'll tell you what I believe? No, Stephen just prays, takes a deep breath, and answers. Just a good reminder, isn't it, about the different roles. Some of the roles, we don't overlap. But this role, in any church, we all share. To speak out for Jesus Christ. Waiting tables have been delegated to them. But Stephen doesn't think that evangelism has been delegated to the apostles no he gets on and does it I want to show us three little things in this speech just to try and make a bit of sense of it three little things the foundational promises to Abraham the faithful person that is Joseph and the foreign places visited by Moses foundational promises a faithful person and the foreign places which is the next bit of the speech that we didn't ask Simon to read out for us as you listen if you're a believer this is your story this is your God and as you listen if you wouldn't want to call yourself a Christian have a look and just see how kind how patient how trustworthy how loving how generous is the God that we meet here in this account the foundational promises are given to Abraham look at verse 2 brothers and fathers listen to me the God of glory or the glory of God appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. That's in Genesis chapter 12. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And after the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you're not living. But verse 5, he had no inheritance. So he was sent to the promised land, but he had no inheritance there, not even enough ground, to make a footmark in so not even a piece of ground the size of a shoebox 
was Abraham's inheritance in the promised land. But what he does have are these promises, verse 6. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and ill-treated. But I will punish that nation, and they'll come out of that country and worship me in this place. And so Abraham is given the covenant of circumcision. Now, in the Bible, covenant is a word for a binding legal promise of love. The closest approximation in our, in our modern day and age is one of these, a wedding ring. A wedding is a legal event. You become legally married. But it's not a simple legal event just like buying a house. You can buy a house of someone you really dislike, but you marry someone that you love. Based in love, but a binding legal promise. Of course, we say not I do. That's the Hollywood version. But the Christian version is I will. It's a covenant, unbreakable, lifelong till death do us part, legal promise of love. And God is the God who makes legally binding promises of love to his people. And one of the most important is this one to Abraham. The covenant of circumcision given in Genesis chapter 15. And that'll be familiar to many of us here. It's one of the key points of the argument in Galatians chapter 3. In Romans chapter 4, you'll have come across it many times in your own personal Bible reading. Here are the foundational promises that God gives to Abraham. And Stephen is saying to these Jews, this is our history. Just as the British look back to Magna Carta. And even today, many of our laws are shaped by Magna Carta. Remember that Prince, that King John was forced into by the barons. I always think of Robin Hood and Disney when I think of King John, but never mind. He was a real king, wasn't he? Magna Carta is still massively influential in the laws of this land. But this covenant, this unbreakable promise, is even more influential in the real lives of Christians today. God is still fulfilling this promise. And if you had the joy of being a, a Christian when you were younger, you may have sung at Sunday school, as I did, Father Abraham. There's many sons. Many sons as Father Abraham. Am I I'm one of them? And so are you. This is our great, 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 very great grandfather. The foundational promises are given to Abraham. But then we get a faithful person. You move from Abraham in verse 2 to verse 9. The patriarchs were jealous of Joseph. The patriarchs, that's the other 11 tribes. You've heard of the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, the other 11 were jealous of Joseph. And they sold him to be a slave in Egypt. Six times in this little section, you're into Egypt. King of Egypt, ruler over Egypt. Famine struck Egypt. No grain in Egypt. So Jacob went down to Egypt. The focus of this section is on Egypt. Remember, Abraham didn't even have a shoebox worth of of inheritance in the promised land and Joseph was blessed in Egypt this is going to be quite important to Stephen's argument in a minute the foundational promises made to Abraham the faithful person is Joseph remember how were Joseph's brothers saved might be worth turning that off oh I see don't worry it's fine no no no, no, not a problem at all. It was going to distract me, that's all. I've got, I've got news. When I was a maths teacher, I, having good hearing is a nightmare when you're a teacher because you can hear what the back row are saying about you. Okay, so you, when you're a teacher, you don't want good hearing. You just want average hearing. Uh, I used to wish sometimes that my ears were a bit less. Let's just get back to this. So Abraham's given these amazing promises, but he's not given any inheritance in the actual promised land. Joseph, all of his ministry, all of his blessings in the land of Egypt, not in the promised land. But think about the Joseph story for a second. How are Joseph's brothers saved? Joseph's brothers reject Joseph. He's God's chosen one. He has those dreams. He has those visions. You remember those? If you've seen the stage show, you'll know he has those dreams about bowing down. The stars bowed down and the sheaves bowed down. And instead of saying, oh, God's revealed his chosen one. We must honor him. Joseph's brothers said, God's revealed his chosen one. We hate him. They sought to kill him. They sold him as a slave. But through this one they rejected, they were actually saved. Their rejected one, God sent to Egypt. 
And in Egypt, he became Pharaoh's right-hand man. And in Egypt, he saved up grain. And then Joseph's brothers, who'd rejected him, could be saved in Egypt. It's a picture, isn't it, of how we are saved. Christian salvation. The one that humans naturally reject, Jesus, actually becomes the one by whom they're saved. So Stephen says you've got some foundational promises, the promises to Abraham. You've got a faithful person. That's Joseph. And we didn't read this next section, but it's really simple to understand. We've got these foreign places in the Bibles there from verse 17 and onwards. We get the story of Moses. Let me just ask you five simple questions about Moses, and you'll see what's going on here. Where did Moses grow up? In the promised land? No, in Egypt. Where did Moses flee to? The promised land? No, Midian. Where did God appear to Moses? Promised land? No, Sinai in the desert. Where did God send Moses? Promised land? No, Egypt. Where did God send the people? Promised land? No, the desert. All the emphasis on the Moses story, again, is not about living in the promised land. You've got Abraham who's blessed in Mesopotamia and settles in Haran. You've got Joseph, whose ministry is in Egypt. And you've got Moses. And all the time, he's outside the promised land. Can you see what Stephen's beginning to do for the Jews who had him under trial? The Jews are saying, you're disrespecting Moses and the law. You're disrespecting the temple. And he's saying, our story has never been about a little group in a little promised land. God has always blessed people outside. Where does God call Abraham? Outside the promised land. Where does God bless Abraham? Outside the promised land. Where does God send Joseph? Outside the promised land. Where does God meet Moses? Outside the promised land. Can you hear what's going to be going on in these Jews' heads? They love their temple. They love their temple, but they've forgotten their story. Their story is of a God who reaches people from outside and who sends people to outside. And if you can prove that from Abraham and Joseph and Moses, then it really is proved. That's what Stephen is doing. He's preparing the way to answer their accounts. What does that mean for you and me? One of the brilliant truths of the Bible is that God is not tied to places. All God's principal dealings in establishing his covenant with his people took place outside the promised land. God is not tied to a geographical place. He's not tied to a parcel of land today. He's not tied within a space of bricks today. You meet many churchgoers, don't you, who seem to believe that God lives in these buildings kind of God lives up there somewhere I think because people get even more bothered when there's a special place up there or something isn't there and and God sort of sits around a bit lonely the rest of the week not knowing what to do there's kind of no one here but he sort of sat up there on that table but that's not the God of the Bible the God of the Bible wasn't compressed into any geographical space his vision was always expansive Maybe this has something to say about Christian Zionism and some of the battles that still go on over that piece of land. Maybe it has something to say about the way we think about our churches. Maybe it has something to say about how we think about who God has called us to go to. The book of Acts, remember, chapter 1, verse 8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the ends of the earth so Christians and believers down the centuries have never been about being a comfortable group that love being how they are they've always been about being a family seeking to expand I think that's something of what's going on here we'll see more next week as we focus back on the law and on the temple But I want to draw this together by saying, what do you think of as your story? If you're a Christian here, then your story 
is a story of foundational, unbreakable promises made thousands of years ago to Abraham. I'll make you into a people, a great nation. I'll bring you to a land, and I'll be with you. And those promises are all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We become a people when we share in one Holy Spirit and we call the same God Father. Two people who call the same man Father are simply family. If you call the same Father, Father, your brother and sister. That's Abraham's promises being worked out in the church. I'll make you a great nation, a great people. That's been done. The place of blessing. Well, for them, it was the promised land. How do we have access now to the place of blessing in Jesus Christ when the curtain was torn in two? Access. We have throne room access. So that one of my favorite writers says that when you pray, it is like sitting on the lap of the king of the universe. You and I, as Christian believers, just walk in. It's, it's, we, have more, we, we sit on the lap of someone with more power than Theresa May or Donald Trump. We sit on God's lap, access to the throne room, and we say, Abba, Father. God's people, yes. In God's place, yes, by the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ. And knowing God's blessing, those promises to Abraham are our story. How? Through a faithful person, a bit like Joseph only more faithful and saving more people so that in the great company of Moses we don't get called to be a happy huddle but an outward looking and expansive family and if you're not yet a believer that can be your story too there is no better story let's pray together Father thank you so much that you gave Stephen great boldness at his trial Thank you that he sought to explain to those Jews then what their true story was. We thank you, our Father, that your promises never fail, that our faithful person, King Jesus, continues to save, and that we're called to reach out to those who do not yet know you, to foreign places, or indeed those living very near to us who are still foreign to you. Father, please might these uh, parts of our story fill our hearts with joy and shape our lives of obedience because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.